here today. Uh, as as uh, Melissa has mentioned, I'm an independent journalist and I work uh, for a variety of publications. I write for both academic media and consumer media like you know, Scientific American and Slate. I also uh, am hired or am commissioned by publications such as Nature to, to work on for uh, in-depth reporting. And my goal here at the law school is to get as many contacts I have, um, I can, and uh, background on subjects that I would normally not have the opportunity to run across. So if you have any ideas for me, just flag me or I'll have my email at the end. So please uh, take the time to reach out. I would appreciate that. I, uh, I think sometimes, um, I don't talk a lot about my work as a freelance editor, but I'm glad that Melissa had mentioned the work for the National Academy of Sciences because that's relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but before I um, start my lecture, I'm going to be the news because I don't normally get to lecture at a law school, so I'm going to take your picture <laughs> um, and document this moment. You will find it probably on Twitter soon, so Instagram. <laughs> and so thank you for that. Um, I, as I said, I'm um, as a journalist, I look around me for stories, and I write normally about <coughs> environment, climate change, energy, and pretty much anything in between. Um, I had done a lot of work in sustainable business as well, so I you know, know a fair amount about that. Um, but I was sitting around my kitchen table uh, about three years ago with my kids. I was working an, on, as an editor at the National Academy of Sciences and uh, working on one of the studies for them uh, having to do with advancing the science of climate change, um, the America's climate choices. And my role was to make the writing as clear as possible. The scientists who authored the report, you know, were completely accurate and understandable, but I needed to make it understandable for a lay audience, or somebody that's a non-scientist reader. And so my daughter was asking me what I was working on, and I had been working on a chapter on sea level rise. And the sea level rise um, chapter was, you know, it was just one of the many chapters I worked on. And so I started trying to explain that to her. She's in sixth grade, she's probably 11 years old. And she said, oh, well, she, you know, cut me off and said, oh, a sea level rise is, you know, caused by two things. You know, it's melting ice sheets and thermal expansion of the ocean. And I'm like, how'd you know that, right? Um, I, you know, I love my daughter. She's fantastic. Uh, she's a hardworking student, but she's not a child science prodigy. I just like, how did you know this? So it turns out that Maryland, we just moved to Maryland from Rhode Island, has a very sophisticated and advanced environmental education um, standards. And that's really what led me to writing about and, and finding stories um, that centered on the crux of climate science education. And as a journalist, I look at the world and I, I report what I see. I hold a mirror to what I see um, in the reflection. And so as it turns out, what I saw was pretty stunning. Um, like teaching evolution, I, I learned that efforts to improve climate science lessons have opened big rifts in the classroom and school districts across the United States were struggling with this. Teachers in every classroom of science uh, really didn't know how to, how to go about doing it. There wasn't very much professional support. Parents um, were pressuring teachers not to teach the subjects. Teachers had to water down the science, not on purpose, but because it's so complex. Uh, special interest groups from the Heartland Institute on the right to folks like Facing the Future on the left tried to buy it and influence the curriculum and what was available to teachers. Some states and legislatures and districts ignored the topic altogether and didn't have it included in their standards. Others insisted and actually wrote this into law on a balanced debate that pits the small minority of scientists uh, who deny human-driven climate change, uh, pitting them against you know, the majority of uh, all Earth scientists um, uh, who support findings on that climate, the climate is changing and is largely caused by human activities. But the landscape is now changing, it's beginning to change, and my report was talking, you know, my reporting followed some of the changes that are going on. Um, 
a leading climate science educator called it abysmal, but improving. So um, I went to see what was happening in public schools, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, one of the promising efforts um, has been through an education nonprofit called Achieve, which brought together uh, 26 states and tried to look at ways that they can influence or write standards that states could adopt. Uh, because if the climate change science standards are not written into the curriculum, then the teachers pretty much can, can teach what they want to teach uh, on a subject. They don't have any <coughs> specifics that need to, uh, to go through. I think that um, one of the things with climate change is that it is so complex, many teachers have a difficulty finding out where they should teach it, or where they can teach it. Um, science and education leaders are trying to broaden this uh, understanding of climate science um, from one narrow unit in earth science curriculum into an interdisciplinary subject, connecting it to the variety of physical sciences and social science classes that, come, that children will come across. Um, the hope is that if educators can effectively teach the nuance of climate change and the complexity of climate change, then it'd be gains that would bolster the overall uh, learning on the subject. And then in that case, as children understand more complex level of thinking, they'll be able to uh, become more complex thinkers. Uh, one of the folks that I talked to from NOAA, he's the climate change science um, education coordinator, said that the uh, reality, it's up there, Frank Michael, the reality of climate change is that it's utterly interdisciplinary. And effective climate change uh, education has to do with strong earth science, biology, physics components, but be connected to science, history, psychology, and economics. I think the people that are leading this movement have focused on the social sciences because those are the things that the students will be facing as they grow up uh, to be leaders in their communities. Uh, and so they, they're looking at some of the solution space. And so what Melissa had talked about with the poem being dismal, I think that as teachers teaching this, they don't want to have it all be doom and gloom. They want to have some of the actions that can be taken or actions needed to be part of the lesson plans, making it a rich and robust education curriculum. But climate change is a subject that many teachers are loath to teach. It's complex. It has you know, all of these social and political and scientific issues that are really far, they encompass a far greater degree than many other science subjects. I mean, as, and in many cases, the science teachers that are teaching these subjects may have their background in biology, but not earth science. And so they're, they're teaching outside of their field of study. In Maryland, I interviewed Donald Bosch. Many of you know him. He's a well-known scientist in, in ocean, uh, ocean science. Um, he's also the head of Made Clear. It's the Maryland Delaware Climate Literacy um, Clear. Education Assessment and Research, something like that. And he's also the uh, head of the, environment, the University of Maryland um, Environmental Science Center. Ultimately, he said that if we taught the students well, um, they would emerge with a better understanding of science behind their <coughs> climate issues and emerge as better citizens of the world. And that's his hope, is that if we can you know, begin to educate youngsters, they'll have an idea of where they're, what they're getting into when they grow up in this world. Climate science is now is taught in many districts in the earth science curriculum, mostly in middle school grades. Everyone I've talked to said if it's left there in sixth grade, it's doomed for failure. Uh, why? Well, I just talked to my daughter. She's now six feet tall and going into 10th grade, and she doesn't remember our conversation about sea level rise. She doesn't remember that lesson in sixth grade that you know talked about the climate science. Um, but right now, as students advance to high school, their core science becomes very specialized. Um, 
displacing that interdisciplinary, predominantly earth science-based concept like climate change. You can read the statistics here. 83% of high school students take biology, then they go on to chemistry, and then they take physics, and just 20% take an earth science courses. And most of those earth science courses are uh, for non, I guess they're reserved for folks who are not going on to college. Uh, and one of the science, or one of the educators I talked to said, look, even if we were amazingly effective at reaching 20% of the high school population, you know, we still would only be reaching 20% of the high school population teaching the subject of climate change. Uh, and so, even in Maryland, where they have fairly good education standards, the teachers that I talked to are still struggling with where to put this unit. In Vermont, as I understand it, earth science is, is a requirement and taught for all ninth graders. That's a unique place. Of course, we, Vermont is a unique place. So, uh, but in most of the US, if they even have it in their curriculum at all, uh, college and high school students are fast tracked to this biology, chemistry, physics, and then AP something or another. They skip earth science. Climate change should be everywhere in the curriculum, but as a result of its complexity, it is nowhere. Jill Carson is the program director of, for education and diversity in geosciences at the National Science Foundation. She has worked with public schools, with private schools, with nonprofits, with uh, co college level uh, educators, and you know she said that college-bound students could hear about climate change in some areas of their, of their high school. They maybe get it in that sixth grade class, but some areas of their high school. Sometimes it's even taught in rhetoric where they get to debate. That's a, a rhetoric example, um, where they get to do hold a false debate on whether climate change is occurring. But you, a, a very frequently a student can go through all the way through high school and not have a single class on, on Earth. I have a teaching degree. Uh, I was a teacher for a brief period of time uh, between being a research analyst and becoming a journalist. And so I, I have a bit of sympathy for what, it's, what teachers need to accomplish in the classroom. You know, there, there's not enough professional development and there's, it's not always available with the time uh, constraints. And for most people, the pay is not enough, frankly, to put up with the level of harassment that can happen. I know uh, Roberta Johnson, who's the executive director in uh, Boulder, Colorado, of the National Earth Sciences Teacher Institute, uh, um, Teachers Association, she told me many stories. Uh, her, this is her area of research, but she told me many stories about where teachers are, are hitting these obstacles in the classroom. And one was about a very well-trained, very well-educated, enthusiastic science teacher in Indiana. The teacher started teaching a climate change unit with a parent who didn't have any expertise in this, but had a PhD in another subject. Uh, it wasn't even science, it was engineering or some, some sort of something else. Uh, was very angry that <coughs> his child would be given a lesson on climate change. And he threatened to come into the classroom and dispute the science and, and, and wanted to engage the teacher in a debate about whether it is human caused. Um, the, the, the teacher who had all of the materials, who had all of the training, who had an advanced degree in earth sciences, um, thinking that the dispute would be something that could be effective learning tool for the kids, said, bring it on, right? So she welcomed the debate. But once the administration, of course, got wind of this, she didn't, you know, want to have, have anything happen. They killed it. They killed the entire unit. They wouldn't let her teach the subject. And that teacher struggle is not unique. Uh, I could give you other numerous examples. I, I did a lot of reporting for the stories that I've written on in this in this series. Many of the reporting, much of the reporting I did ended up as background <coughs> material. I could probably write a book on this, but uh, I could 
give you examples of like in for public schools, the, the teachers are uh, not really engaging in it. They're sort of um, putting the gag on themselves. Um, private schools have another thing. I talked to a private school educator. She was an earth, their, earth, their, their environmental educator for the high school. That was her job. She was their environmental educator. She could not use the words global warming or climate change. This was last year. She could not use those two words. And then her job was an environmental educator. Um, it was a conservative private school, very well funded. They had LEED certified buildings. Her job was to make sure that they, she did the, the green building stuff and the recycling here, and you know she could go around the issue, but she could not use those words in any of her lessons. You know she can get they can get away with that in public in private school, um, but they were worried about losing their funding and what the parents would say. Um, a survey of six hundred. Kindergarten through 12th grade teachers across the U.S. Uh, who teach climate change. These are the ones who teach climate change. They found that 40 percent of these teachers were pressured not to teach climate change at all, but they went ahead anyway. Um, in a separate poll, 82 percent, 82 percent of high school and middle school science educators has faced skepticism about, from climate change from their students from parents and faculty, but from students. And so not all, and not all states teach climate change. You know, I think how, the last count, I haven't done a full analysis of this for about a year, so that the, my numbers may be off, but there was probably 30 something out of the 50 states that had it in their standards. Uh, eight states didn't address atmosphere, weather, or climate concepts. These are Florida, Kentucky, Maine, Nebraska, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. Iowa had no standards. Uh, state laws in Texas, South Dakota, and Louisiana require that any lesson on climate change or on climate science be balanced equally with instruction. I mean, balanced equally with instruction that uh, with the others, the, the, I guess what they call the other side, um, that other scientists dispute the consensus findings that uh, society's greenhouse gas emissions are alter, altering our the newest law is in Tennessee, where the state enacted in last April, where it allows teachers to challenge climate change and evolutions in their classroom without fear of sanction. So if I was a parent and I had a kid in that state, I, my student, was, my child was learning that climate change is occurring and that it's human caused because that is what some, you know, some scientists say, and then they also equal, have equal lessons on this stuff. 99% I, uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, following the teachers, a group of teachers in Maryland from a conservative school district who were trying something new. They wanted to teach an interdisciplinary unit, which is what they're talking about here. They're looking at how water issues will, uh, sea level rise will affect land use change, will affect what Folks are, the, I guess, real estate issues, I mean, a number of things. They were looking at, from soup to nuts, jobs, what's really going to happen um, with climate change. And this, the teachers themselves found that the political debate over climate science mirrors that fight to teach evolution theory. And they just um, had a really difficult time. Some of the kids, pulled out of the class and the parents said, look, you know, when you're teaching that, I don't want my kid there. Uh, the teaching of evolution, though, today enjoys the protection, uh, that constitutional project protection, uh, separation of church and state, but unless the elements and the causes and impacts of climate change are listed in the state standards, then, you know, a teacher can, there's no legal me mechanism that requires them to teach climate science and its causes and impacts accurately. Uh, there, is, there have been some cases where in New York State, it's clearly stated in their standards. So when a parent complained that the teacher wasn't teaching it well,
they actually said, look at the standards, and the teacher was actually forced to look at the standards and said, look, you can teach to the standards or you're out. Um, that's really the, the mechanism right now that's in place in some states, but not many. Across the country, scientific accuracy is being compromised in schools, say a bunch of educators that, that I've uh, quoted on. Um, at this lesson I went to in Assateague Island in uh, Maryland, which is, will, have, will be greatly impacted by climate change. Um, I went to observe the students, they were really on the on the leading edge of a vanguard national effort uh, pushed by these you know, various leaders in climate literacy uh, to broaden climate change from the physical and social sciences classes into the public school curriculum. And even though this is prob probably one of the most sophisticated climate change education units in the country, the teachers felt the need uh, to balance with the world scientific bodies know about climate change with what is represented in the public dialogue. That to me was disappointing actually. I was there as a journalist, I was there to hold a mirror to what was happening. I was a former teacher, I felt sympathetic to these, and here I thought I was following the best, you know, the best example I could find. And they still had a problem. I, you know, I had to report on it, this is what was happening. I, um, they had to avoid the words global warming, uh, and they included a lesson on questioning humanity's impact on the problem. They had religious leaders come in there saying that God would not do this to this to them. Um, it was a three-month unit and designed you know, for the, uh, the high-achieving students um, and developed by the gifted and talented program leaders. So one lesson that they had, uh, the students examined and analyzed editorial uh, cartoons related to the Keystone Pipeline, and they discussed the advantages and disadvantages of building the pipeline. Uh, you know, that's good. That's, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that they need to analyze and look, you know, look at. Another lesson, examined the possible causes of changing climates, you know, differentiating, differentiating between anthropogenic and natural ones. Uh, students studied the greenhouse gases, climate indicators, and carbon footprints, and then they predicted what, what the outcomes would be, especially what climate change would have to do, what would have, uh, they have on agriculture, and uh, the economy, infrastructure, and wildlife. So I went on a full day field trip to Assateague Island, and that was a, a field trip to show how the students are studying how uh, the island is vulnerable to sea level rise, and they are measuring the beach to see what, what the level is here. So they, they said, how do we know? What's the proof? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they, they, were te they were learning science, um, which is all good. But several lessons were devoted to uh, what they should do about climate change. And then at the end, they were to give a public forum on this. Um, but the diversified approach, I think, for this class is a good thing, but it generated controversy, big controversy. Months before the lessons started, the parents heard from, from or the, the teachers heard from the parents and, and stressed that need for balance. Um, virtually, you know, every scientist had said that climate change is occurring and humans are the cause, but the teachers didn't teach to that. So the, the new uh, integrated standards uh, are being put forth right now called the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, they're looking to have better arguments, better interdisciplinary constructs, more cross-cutting themes in science education. And for many states, once they adopt these, they'll have that mechanism uh, for a better uh, standard and a better recourse when it's not being taught well. There'll be better clarity on who's responsible for what. And hopefully, they said, it'll be better integrated into the high school learning progression. Again, this still opens up other people, you know, other folks said, you know, once we, once we open this can of worms, it'll be opportunity for climate change to be taught poorly in the classroom and open up the teachers to more, uh, more backlash. In California, a 
And Massachusetts are among the states viewed as progressive on climate science education because they <coughs> integrate the climate literacy principles in their standards. Like in, ninth, in California, a ninth grade ecology unit with, in, within a biology class, for example, the students might examine a 100-year survey of the state's wildlife population and illustrate what the impact climate change is having is expected to have on animals today, for example. So uh, the Earth Science Teachers Association uh, survey found that 36% of the teachers polled nationally have been urged to teach both sides. And in southern states, 12% of those teachers said they were required to teach both sides of climate change, whereas just 1% of teachers in the Northeast reported that mandate. So one of the leaders on this subject is a scientist by the name of Susan Burr. She's, um, she runs teacher education workshops and is the director of the uh, education and outreach project at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Science um, at the University of Colorado. And she said when the teachers get there, their biggest question is, I need lesson plans and resources so I can teach both sides well. <clears throat> and so she says, from our perspective, there isn't you know, such thing as both sides. There's a scientifically credible side and then there's the misrepresenting, misrepresentation in the public dialogue. And she repeats that with every workshop she does. And she repeats that multiple times. And that's just the reality of her job. Mark McCaffrey uh, was hired a year ago, or a year and a half ago, full time for the National Center for Science Education. He went into a new job. They never, had never had this job before, but his job um, is defending the teaching of uh, climate change science in public schools. Previously, they've only, they only worked to defend uh, the teaching of evolution, uh, but it's now a full-time job for Mark McCaffrey, who was actually Susan Burr's former colleague uh, teaching at, in Colorado. Uh, he said that the reason that is not taught well is partially due, due to neglect, it's hard for some teachers to, to get their head around it when they have so much other material that are in the standards they need to get to. Also, that it that you know the, the you know, climate and energy are complex subjects and emotionally charged, and across the disciplines that kind of fall into the cracks. Uh, you tell me that some of the problems are because sort of the long-term and vested interest to manufacture doubt. In denial. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he, he sees uh, in his work every day. And, and that's led many teachers to believe that they need to teach two sides of the, sub of the subject that really doesn't have two sides. <clears throat> Biggest problem is that there are no state or national standards that, that bring this just to uh, close. Even though the, many efforts by, like I said, the folks that achieved the, the next generation science standards had hoped to bring this subject uh, to 26 states, but it's really still a problem. He said that the climate change and fight against some of the bills that have been in Congress over the last couple of years uh, provide cover for that teaching to the con controversy part of it. Um, and he just encourages this level of accountability um, we have in the legal system to have student or have teachers teach to what is meaningful to others. So I think so the next generation science standards have the ability to address some of the key scientific uh, issues and practices uh, because they're scientifically based and the, they will cover some of the co cross-cutting concepts in climate science. And I think that with you know, the work that all of these groups are doing to make, to give teachers better resources will help with this. But 
getting this to have a ripple effect through the entire educational system is going to take time. Climate change, you know, what they said at the National Academy of Sciences, climate change has, could have the ability to be a, the poster child for science education because it is a systems learning process, it's very complex level of thinking, and it's really what could enrich the learning opportunities for students. Uh, but will that happen? I don't know. I think what Joe Carson said, again, from the National Science Foundation, if we can get the standards climate rich, it's going to have a domino effect uh, of getting into the standards and getting into textbooks and curricula. Right now, the resources just aren't there for teachers to teach it well, although the Climate Literacy Network and, and many other organizations have worked hard at making things possible for, for teachers. I think, um, I, I just want to close by, before I take questions, by wrapping this up. I've written quite a bit about climate change education. My articles won uh, a National, uh, National uh, Education Reporting Award for the continuing coverage of an issue. And I'm not saying that to, to uh, I guess, brag, but I was honored and both surprised because I'm an environmental journalist. I'm not an education reporter. But it, but it goes to show how, how much the subject is being neglected in the media and in public dialogue. It's something hidden. It's something I didn't even know about until my daughter at the kitchen table was telling me about the causes of sea level rise. And so I'm a little disappointed that other journalists are not covering this and that it's not being brought up as much as it, as it could be in the public dialogue because as you know, we are learning uh, here in our classes this, this term, there is potential uh, ability for us to have a sweeping change in how our children learn about the world that will inhabit. And I believe that this continues to Standards as well as you know the, the next generation science standards, which they 
they had 26 states working on them, so they thought, oh, it'd be easy adoption. We've got 26 of our 50 states working on this. These will be our early adopters, and then everybody else will follow suit. Well, that has not come true. They found that there tends to be a lot of uh, emotionally charged debate still in the standard, in, in those states <coughs> that help write the standards. So that's all I can say on that. Um, and and the, as for your the second part of your question, where you just you talk about some of the other interdisciplinary, the economics. I think that is a trend in all of education. They're, they're looking to be more interdisciplinary in everything. So even in an English class, you may have somebody arguing about a biological system or a environmental concern. That, or they'll do a paper on that because it's integrated in with the theme. They're doing that in, in, in other classes outside of climate change. So I think that's a trend I've been seeing. Yes? So it seems to me you have, you describe a political problem and then a practical problem, which is that people don't take anything other than biology in high school anyway. Right. So how do you solve the practical problem? The political problem I don't know how to solve either, but how The practical solve? problem is the standards. So what we're talking about is there's a new next generation science standards that's going to be weaving the bi so everybody in biology, everybody in physics, everybody in chemistry will have some component of climate science learning as part of that physical, chemical, biological system that they're learning. Uh, and it's not there currently. So, and as well, they'll be having it in their economics classes, their social studies classes that they're taking. So they're trying to integrate it into other cross-cutting disciplines. So high schoolers won't get to college and not know the causes and impacts of climate change. I don't check in with science education very often, but when I do, the one thing I always end up hearing is that the United States lags behind a lot of other countries in general in mm -hmm. science education. And I was just curious, on this topic and all of your research, have you learned anything about what other countries are doing? Uh, are, are other countries well, in the, better yes. at this? In the UK, you know, I was, the UK teaches climate science in their, in their upper grades. Uh, and that, that's, I only know that because I've done some work for some UK-based publications, and so I know that. Uh, I had talked to some researchers and educators in France, and they teach it to some degree, but they still have this, they still have the, the silos of, of biology, chemistry, and physics that we have, and it's taught very traditionally. So I think Roberta Johnson, her next, and it should be coming out soon, her next, when I talked to her last, she was next looking at the international scene. And I kept my focus just on the US, it is an area of research that's being followed, but the information is in that book. Yes. On that point, I, I don't think there's any country where there's climate skepticism to the degree there is in the US either. So the, the obstacles you were setting out, I don't think are, are really faced so much. The, my question is, um, the, to what extent have you looked at the why what the part of this? Why is it that people are, it's very emotional for, for people. I thought that the main driver was um, the, the folks who stand to make short-term monetary gain uh, without really planning for the future and future generations. But then you mentioned the God piece, so God wouldn't let this happen to the earth. So I, I, I wasn't familiar with that particular view. So maybe it is, I mean, obviously some of it's religious as well. Um, so if we're gonna see some, make some change, we have to figure out how to so driven to, to, to counter the notion that there's climate change brought about by human activity. The, um, so I've done a lot of reporting on religion and climate change. Uh, the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology uh, has done, they've actually founded this field of study and is working on this um, probably 10 years ago. We, we began doing more on that. Um, and so, <coughs> In, in public schools, it's not so much, but there are you know, the, the private schools that will have that, depending on what 
their religious leaders say as part of their teaching. Yes. Maybe you touched on this, but in your report, did you have you come across uh, teachers uh, in districts where there are limitations or uh, uh, on how they are allowed to cover climate change that um, you know took a political stand uh, and, and didn't follow. That. In Texas, in and Texas, they're required to actually teach sort of both ways, but they don't. They actually can. They, I, I've seen reports. I've not reported directly on them, but I've read reports uh, in the Dallas Morning News and by other New York Times reporters and things like that, where the standard says you must teach, I guess, both sides. And even th because Texas uh, writes their own textbooks, so they actually have it in the textbook as well. Um, so, but the teachers who want to teach accurately caveat the, I guess, the people that are questioning that climate change is occurring and it's human caused. Um, I, I've seen them actually take a stand and say, I won't teach to that, or this is why I don't believe, this is, this is all of the proof on this side, uh, I won't teach this other side. And they've actually banded together to do that and, and teach it accurately. Know, did you notice whether um, organized You know, I don't know, but I know that the National Center for Science Education has worked, they have somebody working full time defending teachers in Texas. Or, yeah, so there's, there's a job for you out there. <laughs> yes? I was wondering if you could speak a little more to both the successes and failures and maybe the opportunities for educating the educators. So, the, yes, that's a great, so there are, <coughs> I don't remember all of my acronyms, but there's CLEAN, the Climate Literacy and Energy Something Network. And they have done an incredible amount of work. They're a coalition of, of the top, with the National Science Foundation, the of NOAA. I wish I had them up here. I probably should have been prepared for that question. But I will get the information for you after, afterwards if you'd like. They have done an enormous amount uh, to provide good teaching materials for educators. They provide workshops, they have distance learning, but of course it's just, it's the time and do you get a grant to do this and how difficult is it for you to choose from all of the things that a teacher can do for professional development during, during their summer vacation um, to do this. So those are some of the obstacles. But the materials are, are more available. Um, there are 15 new research projects being funded by the National uh, Science Foundation to look at various ways to improve climate change in science education in public schools. Maryland's Made Clear is one of those projects that Maryland and Delaware banded together. They're able to look at the local impacts and really make it local. They, they didn't rely on news research, they just helped bringing together the peer research that's relevant to their area. Yes? I think, you know, most of us would agree that it, it's, it's absurd, you know, this anti-science group that wants to be represented in, in, in the curriculum. On the other hand, kids are pretty smart. It, it occurs to me it might backfire sometimes. Does it ever work? Have you, have you ever seen any evidence of that where there's pressure to have the anti, or whatever you want, however you want to characterize it, the anti-scientific people? And if you teach it, and kind of like that first slide you had, I mean, if you do have the debate, maybe that's good for the, uh, uh, for our side, you know, so to speak. It, 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 it just depends on the teacher. Mm -hmm. It depends on how the dialogue is allowed to emerge. It depends on how well the teacher is armed with the right science. And that, that <coughs> happened to some degree with the students in Astigua, you know, at the end of that three-month unit where they had, a, they had conflicting information. And at the end of the unit, they were presenting their projects to their parents. I heard back later that, that many, so this is an opportunity for the students to learn the science. They, they did get some of this me messy stuff on one side that maybe could have or shouldn't have been, but that's the reality of what they're hearing at home, so maybe that's okay. I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm just showing you. But at the end, they were able to bring it together, and I think the kids did learn about science and how science works, and science, you know, science does have allow for skepticism, but they were able to weigh the evidence. 
Now, they were also able to communicate with their parents. Uh, in some cases, maybe they were the parents were swayed by the evidence. That's an opportunity that we you know, don't often know about. <coughs> okay, we're going to wrap it up. If anyone has other questions, you can probably come down and talk to, <laughs> talk please, to her in the front. Please uh, take my email. I'm 